tarde, pessoal. Muito bom estar de volta aqui. Eu começo esse painel uh, dizendo que o nosso tema agilidade tem muito a ver com um paradoxo que o Marcos mencionou no último painel sobre educação, que é o paradoxo do tempo. Que uh, Acho que a, a pandemia nos mostrou o quanto esse paradoxo entre sermos mais rápidos ou sermos mais preditivos precisa ser vencido. E acho que ele é vencido, em grande parte, por essa temática da agilidade. Vocês, uh, aqui na ENAP, nós trabalhamos a temática da agilidade institucional de diversas formas. Eu acho que vocês devem ter já percebido isso na nossa fala de abertura, nos outros painéis, em vários outros momentos aqui uh, da nossa agenda. Mas, principalmente, acontece com a visão de que nós precisamos injetar ideias inovadoras no governo, criar espaço de troca, criar a superfície de contato para o governo interagir com ideias que estão fora, também entender como uh, nós alinhamos, uh, a, a, nos adaptamos para alinhar uma visão de longo prazo a uma visão sistêmica e, sobretudo, como nós vencemos a polarização em algumas discussões e conseguimos uh, um alinhamento coletivo em torno de uma agenda do que, que representa a agilidade institucional. Talvez vocês não estejam vendo, porque a Semana de Inovação tem isso mesmo, a gente se sente às vezes como no carnaval, parece que tem sempre um bloquinho do outro lado da cidade que a gente está perdendo. Tem algumas salas aqui da ENAP, está acontecendo um encontro de um projeto que nós estamos lançando durante a Semana de Inovação, que chama Conexões Emergentes. Que é um projeto uh, que, inclusive, está tá inspirado num, num programa taiwanês de mentoria reversa, e que está conectando pessoas de fora do governo, outsiders, pessoas que têm diferentes backgrounds, com agentes governamentais para literalmente construir essa agenda. É um projeto feito em parceria com a Demos Helsinki, com o João Sigora, a Beatriz, liderado pelo Silvio da Genova e a Marina, e convido todos vocês a acompanharem e conhecerem. Inovação, a gente é um esporte coletivo, nós fazemos sempre com muitos aliados, sempre gosto de dizer isso, e por isso eu não posso deixar de começar o painel aqui mencionando a importância dos parceiros da Semana de Inovação, de todos os co-realizadores dos nossos patrocinadores, Zoom, Cateno, BID, Sebrae, Serpro, Gringo, Microsoft, Adaps, Dataprev, NICBR e 99, além dos, dos apoiadores, o Instituto Repúblico, o Eldorado, a BDI, o Porto Digital, o Museu de Arte do Rio, o Ilinca, Labgrio, a iFood, Catálise, Instituto de Banco e os co-realizadores, que é quem faz essa festa acontecer, que além da ENAP, a Flaxo, TCU, Ministério da Economia e a, a, o Fundage, no, que está nos apoiando, INEP, Organização dos Estados Ibero-Americanos, FUNAS e Ministério da Saúde. E agora, gente, antes de começar e apresentar os nossos palestrantes, eu queria avisar que eu vou moderar o painel em inglês, então vou mudar aqui o idioma e que temos à disposição a tradução simultânea e também quem está nos assistindo. Ok? Então vamos lá, gente. Governments and Agility is the name of our panel today. Uh, this panel will discuss how to increase state's, state's agility and effectiveness. Agile has definitely become a core principle in design public policies and institutions in the 21st century, and I'm very happy to invite our speakers. We have speakers both connecting from Singapore and from Africa, from Nigeria, but I will start with uh, those who are here with us today. So please, Mariam Almasuri. Join us. She's the chief of the UAE Innovates in the Arab Emirates. Eli Dorado, who is an economist and researcher at the Center for Growth and Opportunity at the Utah State University. Ejima, hello Ejima, welcome. Hello. Ejima Utokun who is also joining us. She's the Chief of Staff in the Ministry of Humanitarian um, Affairs in Nigeria. So we will start with you, Marianne. Okay, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Bruna, and to all the organizing team for inviting us here in Brazil. Uh, it's such an exciting time to be here and meeting like-minded people. So um, I'll start today with a story from the past and why it's important to have innovation and why it's important for the future as well. Sorry, I'm just getting used to the technology. 
Okay, so um, the story from our past related to the journey of our innovation is before oil and before the country was even formed, the UAE was dependent on the pearl trade. So our society was built around the pearl industry and it was a source for our economic growth and prosperity. But something happened far away in a country, Japan, where they found a way to make artificial and flawless pearls that disrupted the industry as a whole. But this led our leaders to constantly seek innovation and not stop and understand that changes happen at every sector at any time. So this did not stop us from dreaming big, but it inspired us to be even more bold in what we're delivering. From an arid desert to a green oasis. From a limited local economy to a diversified global economy. From a fishing port to 77 global ports. From one sun sandy runway to a 1 billion passenger airport. From a first participation in Expo Japan to hosting the world in Expo Dubai that happened earlier this year. From lack of streets to building roads on Mars. The UAE was born and founded on fast, responsive delivery of future promises. So what was our journey towards innovation and what are the seven steps we took to embrace innovation in government? The first one is to have a clear vision and strategy to the future that everyone can endorse and embrace. So our aim is to be the world's leading nation by 2071. We want to have the world's leading economy, the world's leading education, the world's happiest society, and the world's leading government. Complementing that, 2015 was declared the year of innovation in the United Arab Emirates. And it was an effort to make the UAE a global leader in advanced technology and innovation, which launched our innovation strategy. Along with the innovation strategy, we launched, as you can see, the Mohammed Marashid Center for Government Innovation, where I work. And it was to... Uh, it's launched to help support the country's vision to be amongst the most innovative governments in the world. So the, the center focuses on three main areas. The first one is experimenting core innovations in government, enriching the culture, and also enabling the public sector. So enabling the public sector and shifting mindsets. Sorry, it's hard with all this, the mic and the papers and the technology that I have, so forgive me. So um, enabling public uh, sector employees and shifting mindset. So the first program that was launched in the government to support this was the introduction of the chief innovation officers in every government entity in the United Arab Emirates. So we have chief innovation officers that lead the innovation in their organizations. And these individuals did not get their title easy, so they had to go through a year-long diploma, which we collaborated with Cambridge University, and it was called the Public Sector Innovation Diploma. So they went through this year-long diploma, and they got their title, and they're now our agents in different organizations in the United Arab Emirates. The second one is um, we established a digital learning platform, which is called Ibtikr. It means innovate in Arabic. And this platform includes massive online open courses. So they are free of charge for Arabic speakers. It's in Arabic because we realized there weren't a lot of Arabic you know, platforms for innovation. And they are based on frameworks and guides that we developed at the center. The fourth step is to provide space and experiment and embrace the future. So co-creation spaces are very important in government. We are located in Dubai in Emirates Towers. So Emirates Towers is uh, this place that we're located in and it's full of places where you can create, co-create with others. It's an open hub of people coming together. So this is a part of like the co-creation spaces that we have. And we also have an edge of government um, space at the Emirates Towers where we showcase different organizations' innovations. So people who pass by, you know, take a look and see what other governments and other um, innovations are happening around the UAE to get inspired and aspire to do more within their organization. The fifth step, which is very important, which we're doing here as well today, is leveraging private and global partnerships. 
So at the World Government Summit that happens yearly in the United Arab Emirates, we host and co-create the Edge of Government Experience, where we have partnered with the OECD to highlight the below radar cases from all around the world and showcase them physically in the United Arab Emirates. We also launched a program uh, recently it's called the Moonshot Apprenticeship Program, and we had a global call out to get, to get the elite graduates from around the world to be part of this program. And they worked hand in hand with our ministers. So 10 were selected, as you can see, they're from different countries around the world. And they worked hand in hand with the ministers of our country to actually solve real life challenges. So we brought them to Dubai and incubated them for a while. The second one we have is accelerating delivery through collaboration and co-creation. So at the Prime Minister's office, we have something called the Government Accelerators, and it embraces all elements of innovation, uh, packaged into 100-day cohorts that speed up the process to deliver fast and tangible outcomes. We also have citizens, citizen engagement and design. And lastly, but most important, we believe, is celebrating and awarding success. So um, in, in the Mohammed Barash Center and in the UAE government as a whole, we have many different types of awards, one of which is the Edge of Government Award, and it's part of the Edge of Government experience that I explained in the World Government Summit. But ultimately, it's also about celebrating innovation. So every year in the United Arab Emirates, we host the UAE Innovation Month, which is the largest nationwide festival in the world. So we have more than a thousand events that happen during the month of February. We host workshops, conferences, we collaborate with different organizations from all around the United Arab Emirates to host these events and conferences and workshops. We also have the UAE Innovates Award, where we award the most prominent, let's say, innovations in our country. And these are some of the award ca categories, like the most innovative use of resources, the most innovative digital transformation. So we get the organizations excited to actually innovate and sustain innovation. And just to end my slides, I'd like to invite you all to be part of our next Innovation Month, which is happening in February. Bruna, let's get everyone there, hopefully, in, <laughs> in February. And thank you so much. Don't ask twice. <laughs> Thank you so much. So inspiring. So after that, we go, we are flying to Singapore first. And we, I'm happy to invite Aaron. Aaron, are you there? I am. Yes. Now I can see you. Thank you so much for being here with us. Aaron is the Vice Secretary at the Ministry of Communications and Information in Singapore. I know time difference is always a challenge, so I really appreciate you being here live with us, considering the time difference. Thank you so much. The floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Bruna. I appreciate very much the invitation from Aina uh, to this wonderful week that you're having. And it is, you know, almost three o'clock in the morning here in Singapore. But quite honestly, I can't imagine anything else I'd rather be doing because, you know, this is such an important effort. And I, I applaud all of you for being, you know, part of this event. I hope that it's a really useful time of, of learning and a mutual inspiration. So I'm sending you greetings from Singapore. Uh, you see behind me here, our national symbol, the Merlion. Uh, I've got one on my t-shirt here as well, uh, which I'm very happy to, to, to have on. Uh, I figured that given we're talking about Agile, uh, I'll, I'll wear a t-shirt um, around, you know, and then be part of that agile you know, kind of tech sort of mindset that we we might all have. Um, and and very much like Mariam, actually, I, I wanted to share uh, seven, seven thoughts today about um, how Singapore goes about maintaining agility in, in the work that we do. Um, I'll share some brief stories in relation to each one as well. And, and if there are any questions, I very much look forward to, to discussing them with you later on. Uh, the first big idea really is that, um, you know, agile regulation needs to function in a way that promotes innovation uh, and is not just regulation for risk management. I think it's very tempting in governments especially to assume that when we regulate, it must be to manage the, the damage, the harm, the, the negative things that can exist. But actually, when we regulate, we need to regulate for promotional reasons too. But we need to regulate to make sure that the positive things um, actually happen. And one way in which we do this in Singapore is that our agencies very often combine both promotional as well as regulatory functions. We don't separate them. 
So as an example, our monetary authority both regulates financial services and it also promotes financial services in the overall economy. Um, we have our, our legal system, which is managed by the Ministry of Law, but they also promote the, the legal industry. And, and while this may seem like it's a regulatory conflict, uh, we actually find that it's a very useful way to ensure that we are thinking about the whole system all the time and that the necessary trade-offs are managed in um, as holistic a way as, as possible. So that's one broad idea that I think is an, an important uh, concrete way in which we implement um, agility in our regulatory practices. The second thing is to keep in mind the importance of the long term, right? Uh, Bruno, you know, in, in your earlier discussion with us, in, in your email brief, you asked us to think about what upcoming generations uh, can do, right, for, for agility. And I think they're super important, right? We need to always maintain a long term focus in the uh, um, overall regulation that we're trying to enact. Uh, and how Singapore does this is that we we actually have a Center for Strategic Futures, uh, which I actually helped set up uh, some years ago. Uh, and, and the work that this does is it helps us to use scenario planning and other methodologies to keep in mind alternate possibilities in the future. By keeping in mind these different possibilities, we are able to prepare for all of them and make sure that whatever happens, the government has at heart, right, a system that it, where it has rehearsed uh, some of the core ideas and, and is able to anticipate some of the, the possibilities that, that are out there. This we find very, very critical, right, and the use of scenarios is something that we've done since the 1980s, and it's a methodology that we've now complemented through the work of the Center for Strategic Futures. What's been really nice is to watch how every agency now has a futures function as well. Right? And it's not just the center of government and the center of uh, strategic futures that's doing this, but all of us, in each agency is actually able to, to undertake this, this long range planning work. The third idea that I, I wanted to share with all of you is the importance of balancing between a scarcity mindset and an abundance mindset. Um, it's very easy to think again about what government does as managing scarcity, right? That core problem of, of micro and macroeconomics. Uh, but what I find is in the, this world, especially, right, given the technological shifts that we're all dealing with, actually, there's a lot of abundance out there. Knowledge and data and information are abundant, right? The more we use data, the more we generate more data, and the more we are then able to use that data in a way that allows us to have insights um, on the different um, issues that we are actually governing as a public sector. And, and I find that this, the fact that data and knowledge and information don't deplete, right, that they grow over time, is actually a really important uh, mindset for us to keep in, 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 in mind. Because if we, if we only manage for scarcity, then I think we lose the possible abundance effects that are out there. This is a key reason why in our Personal Data Protection Act, uh, we try and balance between both protection of data security and privacy, but also manage the business innovation prospects that exist in data rules. We want to make sure that the data is used in a way that generates abundance and doesn't just um, adhere to a scarcity mindset. And the fourth idea that I wanted to go on to, to talk about is the importance of international partnerships. Now, all countries will have different rules, we'll have different traditions, different histories, different cultures that we are all part of. But what's really important, I think, is not that our systems all become the same, but that our systems can talk to each other, right? They, the systems need to be interoperable, to use the, the technological uh, terminology. And, and what does this mean to be interoperable? It's a bit like, you know, when we go to different countries and you have those different plugs, right? There's the British plug with three pins, there's the American plug with two pins, there's the European plug, which is also two pins and a slightly different structure. And, and in each of those, we don't need to have all of us use the same plugs, but we need to make sure that the systems can talk to each other. How do we do that? We have universal adapters, right? Those adapters that allow us to plug into different devices. And I think truly agile countries will be able to use and be these universal adapters for others, right? We can set in place norms and rules that allow our different systems and different rules to talk to each other and interoperate. Uh, one example of this, for instance, in the cyber realm is a growing set of uh, practices known as the norms of responsible state behavior in cyberspace. Uh, this is our set of norms that you know, originate with the UN, 
uh, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which Singapore is a member of, was very proud to be the first regional organization that actually um, signed on to these norms. And they are the kind of rules that allow for this sort of cyber interoperability that I've been talking about. And so the more all of us can ensure that our systems talk to one another, the stronger I think our ability to be agile and to, and to have international partnerships uh, will be. So that's number four. Number five is the importance of internal partnerships, right? Not just external and international ones, but internally amongst our citizens. Singapore places a huge emphasis on citizen engagement, right? Constantly speaking to um, our citizens to understand their needs, to understand their wants and their preferences, so that we in government can put in place policies and services and programs that citizens actually need. Not just what we think they might need, but what they actually need. Uh, and, and we find that this has been really important, right? Uh, Bruna mentioned the importance of this in terms of democratic uh, uh, citizenship engagement. And we find that we have processes in place uh, to emerge from the pandemic, for instance. We've got a process called the Emerging Stronger Together uh, um, set of activities, whereby citizens are constantly engaged to come up with ideas uh, for what they think might be best uh, as, as a set of policies and a set of delivery mechanisms. Uh, we have these conversations very regularly. Uh, we recently announced something called Forward Singapore, which is a process whereby we will be consulting citizens extensively uh, through participatory and deliberative uh, um, processes to make sure that they are part of redefining what kind of society we want to become in the next 10 to, to 15 years. So that's number five, citizen engagement. Number six is the importance of training, right? Uh, because we can't have agility and innovation without uh, public sector officials having the right skills and expertise and knowledge to do that work. And we emphasize this a great deal through all of the different uh, training programs that we offer, particularly through our civil service college and other training institutes. Uh, we do this through topical training on, on issues like innovation or agility. But what we also do is we bring leaders together at different stages of their careers at the, when they first join, when they first become team leaders, when they become directors, and when they're in my sort of position, right, at the deputy uh, um, minister, deputy secretary sort of level. Um, we work with them at all of these levels, and innovation and agility are key components of the curriculum of this training at all of those phases, so that we continually build a culture of, of innovation and agility rather than simply see innovation as a one-off thing that a few people have to do. Right? We want everyone to adopt innovative practices. The last thought that I will share with you is the importance of what I like to call serious play, right? or games if you, if you want. Because when we try and build the ability to be innovative and, and agile, you can't just engage the head. right? You have to engage the heart and the hand of the individual as well. And we find that to do that, to engage the head, the heart, and the hand, we need to immerse people in experiences that allow them to understand the importance of agile approaches. And we find that to do this, we need to actually put them through training that is simulated, training that is game-based rather than training that is overly analytical. So we actually have a section of our civil service college called the Civil Service College Applied Simulation Training Laboratory, right? CAST for short, C-A-S-T. And again, this was a, a project that I embarked on when I was on a different assignment a few years ago. Uh, but it's been lovely to watch how the CAST work and the games that they design have continued uh, since I, I left. In fact, I think they're now doing better work since I've got out of the way. Uh, and it's been really wonderful to see how important this serious play and gaming can be. So those are the seven ideas that I think have been important to Singapore, right? Regulate for innovation, not just for risk. Um, keep upcoming generations in mind through anticipatory, futures-oriented mindsets. Uh, keep in mind abundance, not just scarcity. Have international partnerships. Have citizen partnerships and engagement. Focus on training and build up our capability in game design. And, and if we can do all of this, I suspect all of us will be able to learn much more right, how um, we can be truly agile in the approaches that we take. I'll end there. Thank you again, Bruna, for moderating this panel. And I look forward very much to the discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you. And I really liked that you brought up the, the word abundance. Because later on today, we have Derek Thompson delivering a sparkle session. He's over there waving to me. <laughs> a sparkle session on the abundance agenda. So it's really great. I'm a huge fan of his work, Bruno. Yeah? yeah? 
Okay, so stay yeah. till four, maybe, and you can watch him. <laughs> okay, so now we are flying to Nigeria. We have Edima. Hello. Hello, and uh, good evening. Greetings from Abuja, Nigeria. Um, good morning to you, Aaron, and um, good afternoon to all of you that are here. Um, yeah, so in 2019, um, the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management, and Social Development was um, created. And it was created because um, within government and because of the situations that we faced um, with regards to conflict in the Northeast, we found that humanitarian issues weren't being effectively coordinated. So our ministry was created to come in and effectively manage um, humanitarian issues. So just by the nature of what we are and by our mandate, we need to be agile. We need to ensure that we, we are not reactive in, in our approach to aiding or creating you know, humanitarian action for the vulnerable. And um, so what we did essentially was to create CSEC. So I'm going to take you on a little journey before you know, coming to my, my different points. And I have five points that I'd like to um, make. And um, essentially, CSEC is Civil Security Corporation. Within the theater of operation in Nigeria, what we saw was that there were very different mandates that were overlapping. So there was a bit more you know, chaos rather than you know, community building and resolving vulnerability within the Northeast. And we looked around and we asked ourselves, what is the best way to address it? And the closest was CINIC, which is the Civil Military um, Corporation. However, within CINIC, we weren't able to address key issues that are around the humanitarian environment. And so we decided to develop a concept note, a concept note that would address some of the key issues that were being faced in the Northeast Theater of Operation. And what this essentially did was that it found from research that the key areas that we needed to resolve were issues around communication between the security actors and the humanitarian actors, as well as the um, vulnerable populations in this particular area. We also realized that there was a need to ensure that humanitarian action does not create more problems than they do solutions. We also needed to ensure that we could review CIMIC to now address humanitarian issues within the Northeast. And that was why CSEC came along. So CSEC essentially is a cooperation and coordination mechanism that brings together quite a number of actors and ensures that we are able to provide solutions, we're able to provide interventions to key communities that are vulnerable within conflict. However, we also realized that we could expand this mandate to cover all our situations, you know, disaster management as well. And so that is why CSEC was born. So it's understanding, so now I'm gonna now move to the five points. And the five points is understand what the root cause of any challenge is that you wish to you know, resolve so that you're able to create proactive structure, structures within a reactive environment to allow for us to reach people faster. We have to be objective in you know, the way we resolve things. So what we did then was that we brought together all the um, security actors, all the humanitarian actors, civil society organizations, development partners, and we said, how do we ensure that at any given time, we're able to reach the vulnerable, we're able to provide them with what is you know, required at the right time and efficiently. And then that brings me to the third, which is collaborating with your you know, critical stakeholders. You can't do everything alone. And this is one of the things that I see that Aaron 
and Mariam have really stated. You need to work with local partners on the ground so that you understand the situation and you need to work with international partners who may have gone through this and understand how to resolve it. Um, we also ensured that we were engaging at every single phase of our you know, mandate, the citizenry. And so once again, it's what Aaron is saying, making sure that as you work towards being more agile, being more proactive to your populations, that you are carrying your citizens along so that they are more resilient when you do have issues like, for example, the pandemic. And the last thing that I wanted to mention is that for you to be agile, you need to have women on your team. There is so much that comes to the table when policy involves everyone. In Nigeria, 50% of um, the population is women. And um, we also have 50% of, you know, between 50 and 60% of the vulnerable population being women and children. And so you need to connect with them where they are, understand what their issues are so that you can create policies and you can create interventions that actually meet them at the point of need. It doesn't help to sit in, for example, Abuja, for instance, and create policies that are going to be utilized in the Northeast, in Madugri, in Yobe, in Bornu. You need to engage. You need to understand that creating policies in silos or Creating mandates in silos doesn't really help anyone apart from that ministry. So what we were essentially able to do is that now Nigeria has the CSEC strategy that has created from it a humanitarian help desk, which means that essentially we can reach out to anyone and people can reach us and say, we have this crisis or we have flooding in this area. Or we have, so we, we are able to attend to issues as in it when they happen, rather than waiting till the next day or the next week to get things done. And with the nature of government, and I'm sure you're all aware of this, there's a lot of bureaucracy. Humanitarian issues cannot wait for bureaucracy. And we saw that in the first month of the humanitarian ministry being created. And so what we had to do was set up as well, what we call the National Humanitarian Coordination Committee. Now, what that committee has is my honorable minister as the chair, the national security advisor as the co-chair, the service chiefs, all the internal um, uh, civil authority. It has members of CSOs. It also has um, the resident coordinator of the United Nations on it so that when issues happen, they can meet immediately. They can take decisions and they can ask the president to endorse those decisions so that we can carry them out immediately. So this is what has made our ability to reach people at their point of need because vulnerability, understand, can happen to anyone. And we all saw that in the pandemic. And with cutting down the decision-making process, what we've essentially done is that we've been able to mobilize close to 10 ministries, the military, all the paramilitary organizations, the United Nations, all in one committee that can take decision almost immediately. So that, I mean, if you think about it, if we had to write letters to every single ministry, and every single um, agency and department that was involved in you know, assisting with regards to humanitarian action, it would take us a year to resolve one thing. So um, for us, we're really proud of the CSEC structures. We're really proud of what we've been able to achieve from it. And from that, we're working towards peace and stability in Nigeria. And that has now led us to my final um, structure, which is the National Humanitarian Development Peace Strategy. 
And what that does is that we do not only react to things that are happening, but just like Erin said, it's long term. So we are ensuring that as we are creating structures to address humanitarian issues as they happen, we're also capacitating the people within these communities to develop themselves and be more resilient to these issues. So I think for me, I'll stop there and I look forward to the discussions that will come. Thank you so much. So now I want to talk to Eli, who's right here next to me, on your perspective and agility, and you have also eight minutes, Eli. Thank you, Bruna. Uh, it, it's such a pleasure to be here uh, at, at an app in, in, in Brazil. As you know, I, I uh, lived in Brazil as a small child, uh, so it's, it's just a real joy to be here uh, today with all of you, and it's been a great week so far. Uh, I only have one point to make, uh, so in, in my, my eight minutes. And I might get there in kind of a meandering way. So everybody bear with me. I, I want to start actually with a story from my childhood in Brazil. And I want to warn you, it's a sad story. So prepare to be sad. Um, and uh, not, not joking, it's a sad story. Um, so it must have been when I was about two years old. Uh, you know, my family was at a gathering of friends uh, in, in Rio de Janeiro. Could have been anywhere. Could have been any, any, any country. Um, and they were spending time with uh, other young families, uh, young children, their parents of young children, and um, I, I had some playmates there. And my mother went outside into the backyard to get some air, and, and there was a swimming pool, and, and she looked down into the swimming pool, and there was a, a body in the swimming pool. It was a, the body of a small child, of a two-year-old child. Um, you know, I, she screamed, she thought it might be her, her two-year-old child, me. Um, it, it wasn't, but people came, they pulled the body out, and, and, and the child died. And it was, it was devastating for the family. It was traumatic for her. She had nightmares for years to come. So I told you it was a sad story. And, and I, you know, I told you that sad story for no reason whatsoever, and I definitely won't come back around to it. Um, so let's move on to the theme of the panel, um, which is, uh, you know, cases of agility. Um, I'm going to cheat a little bit by going back uh, almost 400 years to the beginning of science. Um, I'm thinking about like the founding of the Royal Society in 1660. Um, all, the, all of the scientists of those days have now have laws named after them, right? Uh, uh, you know, they were amazing. Um, they were bold. Uh, you know, you had like Robert Boyle, who was the founder of chemistry, and he came up with the ideal gas law. And, and, and really the, the Royal Society just was the circle of, of people that were around him. Um, Robert Hooke had the, the law that was named after him about the deformation of springs. And he also published uh, you know, uh, one of the first books that had drawings of, of microscopic organisms. And he invented the word cell. So he, you know, he's the founder of cell biology in a way. Um, uh, Isaac Newton was president of the Royal Society for, for several years. And you know, he came up with uh, the laws of mechanics, uh, arguably invented calculus, and, and did many other things. Um, so, What's amazing to me about these, uh, these giants of science uh, and their contemporaries is that they had such a bias for action. They did everything. They just did it. They, they made telescopes to observe planetary orbits and microscopes to observe microorganisms. Um, they, they weren't shy about doing disgusting things. They, they gathered every type of bodily fluid they could find and they put it under a microscope. They did really gruesome experiments with animals where they cut apart uh, animals while they were alive to see how they worked. And they, um, they had no hesitation at all. And this was all done with the approval of the crown, right? It was the royal society. The, the king gave his, his assent to it and, and had, they gave his support and his protection, right? Because I'm sure there were people who were like, well, Isaac Newton is a witch. Um, so the protection of the crown really mattered. So they did all this uh, in the Royal Society because they had a sense that they were at the beginning of something special, beginning of the scientific enlightenment. And there was so much fundamental work to be done and there was no time to spare. So I've been thinking a lot about the early days of science in the past week or so because last week, um, there was the results of, of a new experiment that was published in the journal Nature. 
Um, and it seemed to me equally fundamental to like what was happening almost 400 years ago and at the beginning of science. So these, these scientists from Yale University, um, they, they, they took some pigs, they anesthetized the pigs so the pigs felt no pain, there was no, no animal suffering here. Um, and then they stopped the pigs' hearts. They killed, killed the pigs. Um, and they, they let the pigs lie on a table for an hour, dead. Um, after an hour, they connected the pigs to a machine and they started circulating uh, an infusion, a drug cocktail, um, a solution that they in invented and threw the pigs' dead bodies. And the pigs' organs came back to life. Um, the, the heart started beating again. All the major systems came back online. The solution that the, science, uh, that the scientists were using had, did have a factor that suppressed brain activity, but if they hadn't included that, the pigs would have woken up. You know, they, 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 they were bringing it back. Um, so this, this was, as I said, reported in the journal Nature, but it was also reported in the popular press in, in the New York Times, uh, among other places. And in the New York Times, about half of the article was devoted to bioethicists who said, don't worry, it will be a long time before this is ever used in humans. This is going nowhere, essentially, is what the bioethicists said. And I immediately thought about drowning victims. See, hmm. when you die from drowning, your cells aren't dead right away. You know, you're, 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 what, you're, what we call death is the kicking off of a cascade of a chain reaction that causes your cells to die over a, 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 some period. And so at the time that you drown, your cells are still alive. And if your cells are still alive, there's a possibility that we could bring you back. You know, it's the same if you die from a loss of blood, like a, a gunshot wound or a, a mistake during surgery. Uh, what the pig experiment shows is that we can bring you back. And in the time that I have been speaking, uh, statistically, one to two children around the world have, uh, under the age of five, have died of drowning. Um, what if we could bring them back? Uh, you know, that you can imagine finding a child in a pool, and you call the paramedics, and they could show up quickly and start the infusion, and the child could recover and, you know, uh, you know finish the, the, the recovery in the hospital, and then later be sent home. And instead of a tragedy, we could have a triumph of, of science and human achievement. Um, but to prevent the future tragedies, we need the speed, the agility, and the urgency of the earliest scientists. And, uh, you know, when this starts getting tested in, in humans, you know, after it goes through uh, a lot of ethical review and so on, I can tell you with absolute certainty what will happen, which is that 100% of the control group will die. Right? Um, so, so we know what will happen, and, and we, you know, we need to move forward. So we, we, I think what this experiment shows is that we are still at the very beginning of human understanding, and there is still a lot of fundamental work to be done. So uh, let's go faster. It's time to create. Let's go faster. I think we already have a subtitle for the Innovation Week. Thank you so much. It's really it's impressive. Um, but um, I totally, uh, so I want to I wanna ask a few questions to you, um, Aaron and Edima and Marian, Eli. I do have a couple here, but I will start uh, with a little, I'd say it's kind of boring, but I, I do have to ask you, and I believe we have some people working in the regulatory system here. And uh, we are always taught, we, when we discuss fear and why don't we innovate or why don't we move faster, we are talking about the checks and balances systems in our, in our government, in our system. So I want to ask you, what do you think, uh, I was, key, I started with you, Aaron, and, um, and then Edima, what do you think are the main differences between a regulatory environment that hinder or foster innovation? It's a great question, uh, Bruna, to, to start with. Um, 
I think one key aspect, uh, well, two, two, two key thoughts here. Right? One is just to keep in mind, right, that that when we are doing either innovation or or regulation for risk, either way, we are creating an experience for people. Right. Actually, all public policy is the creation of experiences. We're creating experiences for our po- political masters. We're creating experiences for citizens. We're creating experiences for businesses. And so I think the core thing we have to ask ourselves is what do we want that experience to be like? Do we want it to be onerous and boring? Do we want it to be demanding? Or do we want it to be as positive an experience as possible, such that even if the outcome at the end is negative, right? I don't get what I want from a regulator. I I make an appeal and it doesn't turn out to be successful. But do I go away feeling that I had a good experience from it, right? When I'm processing my passport, is it a good experience even if it's a bit late? How do I get that experience? When when, when people in Singapore, if you apply for a foreigner's work pass, how does that experience be a good experience or not? I think that's actually at the core. And if we want to regulate for innovation, then we have to craft these experiences such that innovative potential is maintained in, in the best uh, possible way. That, that's one aspect. The other thing that I would also add is that we need to make sure that we, when, when you're regulating for innovative purposes, that data and information that, that we take in as a government, we don't end up overproducing that information or over or over-requesting it. Uh, One of the most frustrating things that I think any citizen goes through or any business is when you have to fill up countless PDF forms, right, over and over again, just uh, to satisfy multiple different government agencies. Um, I think the once-only principle is a really important one, and it's something much more possible nowadays with digital technology. And the more we can take that information in and then cross-deploy it across different parts of the system, um, the better off, um, I think, uh, entities that are being regulated will be, right? We certainly try to do this in Singapore. I know friends in Estonia who do the same thing, right? One time collecting of information, and then you use that information across the entire information architecture uh, that a government has. So I think those are the two things, right? Collect information only once and then design experiences that are as positive as possible uh, for uh, innovation to take place. Thank you. Ajima? Yeah, um, I totally agree with what Erin has said. The experience is really necessary. Um, It's one of the reasons why within our ministry, we have what we call a one-stop shop in the sense that what we try to achieve with, you know, humanitarian um, actors wanting to get visas and things like that, humanitarian actors wanting to get clearance to go into certain areas, rather than them going to the different, you know, ministries or um, agencies, or parastatals that handle this, they come to us. It's the same way when you're also resolving an issue. When you are creating regulations, you need to ensure that you also, beyond just the experience, you empower your team or the, you know, your, um, yeah, your team to take decisions at certain levels. And that's what we're also trying, you know, to do in Nigeria, ensuring that we don't create, you know, abundance of paperwork, ensuring that people can meet us, can actually interface with us, having a face, having um, a means of where you can go and get things done. So I think um, for you to be able to regulate, essentially, you need to make sure that everything is fit for purpose. Nothing should be done just for the sake of doing it. Um, We do understand that there are bureaucracies that exist, but If we're going to be agile, some of these things, you know, the way and the nature in which the public service and the civil service work um, has to change. And that is what we've been able to do in the last three and a half years. Changing the experience, not only for the people that we are working for, which are the vulnerable, but also changing the experience for our team within the ministry so that they are able to achieve more in less time. So I think it's, it is very necessary for you to, when you're creating regulations, policies, um, legal instruments, whatever it is that you want to utilize within your country, you need to make sure that it is a one-stop shop in a sense, so that the experience is easy and you also need to make sure that you empower um, your team to be able to take decisions as well. 
Great. Thank you, Adima. And um, Marianne, one thing I was really impressed looking at the pictures that you saw you presented us is how, how many uh, young people you have involved in this, uh, in this innovation process throughout the country. So I want to ask you, how are youth included within the effort of government to spread innovation, to innovate? And how are, are you trying? What are the experiences that you are uh, you are steering to to achieve that? Sure. So youth make up a lot of the percentage in the United Arab Emirates, and we're also we're always constantly trying to make programs for them. So this year we launched actually a government innovation youth council, where we have agents from different um, sectors and organizations in the United Arab Emirates to be our agents in the innovation field for the youth. So what better way to reach the youth than by the youth themselves? So we selected a group of seven and they create projects for the youth. They disseminate the innovation culture to the youth themselves. Um, I think we also see a lot of youth participating in the innovation month. So you see like little kids participating by showcasing their innovations or you see like young artists trying to showcase what they have done. Um, so including them in these celebrations of innovation and in the projects that we do is very important. Yeah, um, well, it's clear that in Brazil, for example, the leadership roles, the people that are designing public policy, they are the majority men and baby boomers. So we also define ways to in engage more different generations to at least like discuss those policies. Eli, what, um, it was really, it was, it was a really like you paint a picture in front of us in order to make us move faster. But I want to ask you one question. Imagine that all venture capitalists in Brazil got together and they have a big grant, billion, I'm talking about a billion, to deliver, to make, uh, to, to make us move faster in terms of science. And you are the one running this fund. What are the, and you have to gr design grants with no strings attached. What fields in science would you, would you support and why? It's hard to do it in a vacuum and just say what field, right? But, but I think, like, like, for example, I think biotechnology is moving so fast right now. It's like, not just the pig study, but, but so many things in biology are happening fast. And, and it's probably the field where the experimental science is most dis disconnected with the applied practical side, which is medicine. So if you look at the disconnect between what biologists are capable of doing in the lab and what doctors are capable of doing in the clinic, the divide is massive. And it's, I think it's all, uh, you know, essentially for reasons of insufficient urgency. You know, uh, there, there isn't an urgency to, uh, to take the findings from the lab and, and translate them to the clinic as quickly as possible. So if, it, if it's just about trying to get science moving as fast as possible, that's that's where I make the investment is in, is in biotech. Yeah, if it, if it were not the venture capitalists, but government with this billion known strings attached, would your answer be the same? I think that the uh, where I'd spend the money is on the translation. Yes. Right? I would find the most exciting results from the laboratory, and I would say... I want these techniques in my medical clinics as quickly as possible. And, you know, uh, my country is going to become the, the leader in, in uh, quickly translating uh, the, the latest findings from science. If you think about it, so, so one thing that has absolutely revolutionized uh, biology in the lab in the last decade is, is CRISPR. Like, scientists can edit genes of organisms. There are no... Uh, CRISPR treatments available yet for humans? M maybe, maybe one, and they're all, uh, they're all just all the everything in the pipeline is like very obscure, rare diseases where there are no other treatments. There's nothing, uh, nothing moving forward that is uh, that widely uses um, or that's widely uh, uh, applicable that could use CRISPR. So, so I think there's absolutely an opportunity to try to translate as quickly as possible from the lab to the clinic. Excellent. So the adoption also, the adoption curve made it steeper, right? So the, um, I will ask you one quick question to each of you, and we will ask you to be very, like, 
objective in this. Uh, so we talked about uh, moving faster, what's holding us back, what are we doing to move uh, forward and faster. Um, what do you think is holding us back? One element. And if you were to rank your, your government, each of you, from one to five in terms of agility, how many stars would you give and why? Which is two quick questions for us to wrap up this. Should I start? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think what's holding us back is that we need to connect more. I feel like not everyone is connecting. Like we didn't know about the Brazil Innovation Week, but when we heard about it, we wanted to come here, you know? And you maybe, maybe no one heard about the UAE Innovation Month, but our goal is to have you hearing about it. So I think connecting with people, talking to them, even if it's just passing by the hall and just connecting on innovation. And I think that brings us together. If I would rank my government, I would definitely give them a five because every day we wake up to the newspaper, we see different announcements being made, we see different things. They're very agile and it makes us more agile as well. Yeah. Thank you, Marianne. And we are definitely going for the month. Aaron and then Dima. Thanks, thanks, Bruna. Um, Mariam, I hope that, that invite extends to those of us who are online as well. We very much, I, I'd certainly love to come join you for your innovation month. Um, Bruna, that was a great question. I love that you asked it. Um, I would say that the biggest thing holding us back is the failure to adopt experimental uh, mindsets. We are very good in governments at being structured and ordered and very efficient. Um, that's one kind of policy making, but there's a different kind of policy making on issues that are complex and emergent, where we have to give ourselves the space to try things out, fail, learn, and then get better at coming up with a new solution after that. And when you do that, you have a very different set of priorities. It's not just about efficiency. It's not just productivity. It's about productive failure, failing, failing fast and learning fast in the whole process. Uh, so I think the more we can adopt that um, sort of mindset, the more we'll be able to do the sort of agile approach uh, that you, you mentioned. Um, I, would think, I, I would say Singapore is a, is a five on vision and ambition um, and a four on um, delivery. Uh, I think we try our best, but there's always room for improvement. And so I want to give us that space to go from four to five um, in the future. Thanks again for having me. Thank you, Aaron. And I have to say that the Center for Strategic Futures is a great inspiration for us here at the Innovation Division in Brazil. Edina, thank you so much. I think for me, I, I, I would say um, what is holding us back is that quite a number of our organizations or parastatal are not outcomes driven. Um, and when you talk about being outcomes driven, it's looking at what you know the vision is and just working with every single critical stakeholder to achieve it. Um, so I think if we can overcome that, um, being outcomes driven, um, which also means that we must collaborate locally and internationally a bit more, um, that would definitely push us you know, into the future as a much more agile nation. Um, when it comes to my government and what I would score, I'd say five, I'd say five. Um, because we are um, very visionary and we are working towards it. Um, and that's what needs to happen. Um, there's always, you know, we can always go above five. We can always, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> you know, create a situation where we can rank ourselves five plus one plus two plus three. Um, but I think um, we are a country that is working towards a more outcomes um, driven you know, process of doing things. So, yeah, I think we sh that's what is holding most governments back. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us, Eli. Uh, I think the biggest thing that's holding us back, at least, uh, you know, in, in, in democracies, uh, it's ultimately the people that are at fault if things go wrong, right? Uh, so so I, I think it's a culture of complacency. And we're not demanding more. We're not, de you know, uh, the public is not demanding that we go faster. So... Uh, you know, I give the people like two stars, uh, like, like like at least sometimes they play, pay lip service to innovation, um, but uh, but but they're not doing enough to demand it. Yeah, to move faster is good to have the to keep the bar, to raise the bar, right? So I want to thank you all for being here, and I want to say what a great pleasure it is to moderate this panel. I think this panel. 
proves that Innovation Week has touched the world and has been touched by it. It's really great to be here. Thank you so much, everyone.